Hi everyone, this is Peter. You're watching Thailand Bound and as it's a Saturday morning, it's time for viewers stories once again. I've got three great stories to read out for you. Before I get into the stories, I just want to say a big thank you to everybody who responded to my poll that I sent out. As you know, I'm off to Bangkok in the middle of December. I've I'm going out for three weeks unless anything changes. It could do with everything that's going on at the moment. Um, but when I go out, I uh, the, the poll I sent out, I, I asked people, would you like me to continue to tell the stories while I'm in Bangkok or do you want me to do other stuff? And most people came back and sort of said, look, you're going on holiday. Have a good time. Forget the stories. We'll be here when you get back. Um, but I, I don't think I'll forget them. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to pre-record They'll be shorter, maybe just 10 minutes, three stories, and I'll put them out from Thailand on the Saturday so I don't have to actually prepare them and uh, tell the story and edit them and all the rest of it. They'll be there sitting on the server ready to go. I'll just click a button. So you will get something every Saturday morning as well as all the other footage. I'm gonna, I am gonna. plan to uh, film in Bangkok. I hope to visit Hua Hin and maybe Cha'am, maybe even Rayong, who knows. Um, so that's my plans, that's mid uh, December. Right, but back to today, let's get into these three stories and uh, they're very, very good this week, guys. I am an expat Brit living in Israel with dual nationality, British and Israeli nationality. This time I really want to respond to last Saturday's story, one of eight, when you talked to the, about the guy who was ripped off at a karaoke club he had had too many drinks, had surrounded himself with a few girls in a closed room at the club. He consequently lost count of the number of drinks he had ordered and was presented with a bill for 40,000 baht. I can't remember how he got out alive, but he did. On my first trip to Thailand 10 years ago, when I was 65 years old, I went with a friend who had already visited there many times. We stayed at a friend's condo in Chiang Mai on the banks of the River Ping. My friend's experience and my own common sense had helped me then, and since then on, frequent trips to the land of smiles. Subsequently, I quickly sized up the situation regarding how I could enjoy myself and how I could avoid being scammed. After the first three days of experience in the joys of massage, I went looking for a karaoke club. I had no evil intentions in mind, just wanted to enjoy a few hours out in the company of the ladies while having a go at singing. Walking along the same bank of the River Ping, about 15 minutes from the condo, I came across a karaoke club with a line of about 10 gorgeous ladies standing outside. It was early evening, quite cold outside, with a little bit of rain and no other farangs wandering around on that main road. I approached a few of the ladies and engaged them in a brief ca casual conversation. However, I quickly discovered that only one of them, a good-looking girl in her early 20s, spoke good English. I thought she wanted to be the only one to spend some I thought she would be the only one to spend some time with. I wasn't going to sit in a closed room for 2 or 3 hours with someone who barely knew English. The one I chose was good looking, lively in conversation and had a pleasant demeanor, so we went inside. On the way in, the mama san showed us to our room. She was also in her early 20s and was a complete knockout. She was by far the most gorgeous girl I'd seen since arriving in Chiang Mai. The Mamasan was unusually tall and beautiful with long black hair and she wore a tight fitting dress that enhanced her gorgeous figure. So I thought I could talk with a nice girl I had met outside, I could perhaps dance with the Mamasan stunner and sing to the both of them. Since there were no other clients either waiting outside or inside, the Mamasan agreed to join me. This meant I would pay for the company of two girls and their ensuing ladies drinks. Now one thing I haven't mentioned till now is this. Despite the fact this was my first trip in Thailand, I knew when traveling abroad and particularly when walking around a strange city at night, I would never go out alone at night carrying more cash than I could afford to lose. Also, I never carried my credit cards with me at night. I hadn't yet understood Chiang Mai, so I assumed wrongly as it turned out that I could possibly wander into a bad district and be robbed. So on that particular night, I had less than 2,000 baht in my pocket. Another thing is that I'm not a drinker. I have diabetes and as we all know, alcohol has a high sugar content. So another line of defense I have about not being robbed or scammed is that I am always sober. In fact, I get high on meeting beautiful ladies and enjoying their company while dancing and singing with them. After being with these two gorgeous girls for about two hours and after they had drunk only a few ladies drinks, 
I asked for the bill. It was brought into the room. I saw it was almost a thousand baht above what I had in my pockets. I had to make a quick decision. I turned to the Mamasan and told her that I couldn't pay that sum. She started to frown. I knew that I could either start an argument and say that the bill couldn't be right, or I could take another line of approach. So I said, look, I'm an old guy. I know that if I don't pay, you have the guys waiting outside to deal with me. Difficult customers. We have enjoyed two great hours together. You're both wonderful people. I love Thailand and I think that I will come again with more money next time. And anyway, there were no customers. To underscore my situation, I pulled out my pockets and showed her all the cash that I had on me. She obviously realized there would be no point in getting the boys to rough me up. So she thought for a second and said, it's okay, you come back soon, okay? I paid and left after hugging them both and planting a kiss on their cheeks. I had not a single Bart left in my pockets, but it was only 15 minutes walk back to my friend's condo. A week later, I spent my last three nights in Bangkok. Like all first time male tourists, I headed for Pat Pong. I enjoyed the sights and sounds in gogo bars. Finally, I found a crack in the wall karaoke and live band bar on the upstairs veranda of what was probably Soy Cowboy or another one close by. The room was no more than three meters wide, about seven meters long, contained a male three-piece band, had a bar and six ladies. Yet again, I found myself in an establishment as the only male customer. I ordered a non-alcoholic soda for myself and a ladies drink for one of the girls. After a second or third round of drinks, I asked the small band if they could play any Elvis songs. They said yes, and I sang very bad renditions of a few Elvis numbers. Then I started dancing to heavy rock music with two of the girls. As I already said, I get high on dancing. In the middle of this, I saw a bell hanging above the bar. At the right point in the rhythm, I pulled the rope under the bell. A high cheer went out from all the staff. I asked why they were all cheering. They explained that by ringing the bell, I was ordering drinks all round for everybody. I responded by telling them that I am a non-drinker, had not understand the rules of the bar, and yet again, it was understood that I was a newbie and a non-drinker. They were all very nice about my lack of bar knowledge and said that they wouldn't charge me for drinks all round. So I bought just the band a round of drinks, had a few more dances and then left. All I am saying is that it doesn't pay to get drunk or let's say blind drunk in a strange land when you are out by yourself. And if you behave nicely and don't offend people, the Thais and even bar girls can sh show you that not every one of them is a scammer. They are just poor people trying to make a living in difficult circumstances. Most of the girls come from farming communities in the north of east of the country in the province of Isan. Their parents, grandparents and children rely on these girls to send money home. They are not bad people, they are good people in difficult circumstances. The country's economy depends on tourism. Whereas a large population of bar girls in the West working in clip joints and call girls are either there to earn money to support a drug habit, or even worse, still ha have been trafficked by criminals, these local Thai girls are so devoted to their families that they are sometimes prepared to work in the bars or as freelancers. I can't blame them. Having told you about my karaoke experience in the past, lastly, I want to give you a quick update about how Thailand is now after almost two years of the pandemic. I haven't been able to visit there due to travel restrictions, but my last week in mid-October 2021, my friend who had owned the condo in Chiang Mai decided to fly to Phuket. Before leaving, I told him that this trip would be a test case for me. Since the epidemic hit worldwide and basically destroyed the tourist industry in Thailand, I wondered when it would recover and deal with the new reality. In 2019, I think Thailand had about 20 to 30 percent of its income from tourism. But all of that dried up. Every week I watch videos of the current situation. During this last month, efforts are being made by the Thai Tourist Authority to gradually reopen the country. Many YouTube channels optimistically report plans for renewal. However, here is my update from my friend in Phuket. His WhatsApp response to my questions was this. On the 19th of October, I'm so depressed. It will pass, of course. This place compares to a favourite aunt that has developed Alzheimer's, MS and Parkinson's since my last visit. He included a few photos of empty streets in Phuket and added, the first picture is the main entertainment street in Phuket at night when it's usually very busy. 
I'm not sampling the wares. My hotel is very near, honestly, Scout's Honor. Look at all the closed places, McDonald's, Starbucks, Burger King, etc. Peter, I would have liked to end on a high note, but sadly this is the case. Will Thailand ever return to the tourist destination that we all love? What is your opinion, Peter? Okay, so obviously this uh, story was sent to me before the country started to open up on the 1st of November. Uh, I, had, I was backed up with stories. I'm running real short now, guys. So if you've got any stories, please send them in. Um, but with regards to his question, yeah, I think it will bounce back. It will take time. Will it ever be the same? Who knows? The Thais are very, very resilient people. Uh, as I said at the beginning of the video, I'm booked to go back in the middle of the month. When I uh, have the live stream on Friday nights, many guys leave comments that they're going in December, they're going in January. So people are starting to go back to the country now. The Thais want us back because tourism is a big part of the economy. And it will be a slow, painful process. But I think eventually, yes, it will get back to something similar to what we knew before the pandemic. Okay, this next story is probably one of the longest stories I've ever read out on the channel. I think it's about 15 minutes long, but it's a great story. And uh, I won't say any more than that because I don't want to give the ending away. We'll talk about it at the end. I was married for 16 years and decided to get divorced because life was awful and I thought I would end up in a box. So I had to decide on what I wanted to do once I left my wife. I decided that I wanted to travel. Soon afterwards, I was doing singles holidays from the Canaries to the Caribbean at the time. I thought Thailand was full of sleaze, so no way that I wanted I was going to go to Thailand. At that time, I was involved in online dating, but I always found that the women on dating sites were looking for the next best thing and nothing worked out apart from the odd romance. After a while, I joined an internet site called Companions to Travel, and after a few weeks, this lady called Sue contacted me and asked me if I would join her on a holiday to Thailand via, via Dubai, where she wanted to spend 24 hours. So without ever meeting Sue, we booked a flight to Thailand with Emirates and we arranged to meet at Glasgow Airport. It was an amazing experience. We had only spoken on the phone and sent photos via email. So we are now on our way to Thailand with a transfer in Dubai. On the flight from Dubai to Bangkok, Sue decided to have a sleep. When she woke up, she asked if there was any sign of the breakfast. I told Sue that she had missed it because she was asleep. Sue was not happy with me, so she went to the galley to ask if there was any breakfast left only to be told that it would be served in 30 minutes. Sue was fuming with me. Obviously, this was a joke. Anyway, three days in Bangkok and then a flight to Phuket for around seven days. On the flight, we sat, we sat next to an American guy who I will call Josh. And honestly, he started to talk to the pair of us and tell us about our lives. And he knew everything about us, our jobs and personal stuff that no one could ever know. It was shocking. Anyways, we said to our goodbyes at the airport and off to the hotel. What we found was amazing. We would meet Josh in the strangest of places in Patong. In our hotel reception, even though he wasn't staying there, there was a fortune teller stand where he was sitting chatting away to the fortune teller. Josh just had this gift. He could tell your life story just by magic. And I witnessed it when I had the odd night out with him and he was talking to girls. Now this story is absolutely true. We went out to an Italian restaurant in Patong that he had visited a couple of years before. Josh asked the lady if her husband was still around. She informed Josh, Josh that she, he had passed away recently. What was amazing is that Josh had told her on his last visit that her husband wouldn't be around much longer and that he had an illness. Writing this story is bringing it all back to me. Anyway, myself and Sue used to chat with a few girls in the bars and spent time with them. The girls used to tell us the secrets of bar girls and the ways to drain a man's wallet. They also told us about their sponsors. Some girls had four or five men sending them money on a monthly basis and how it was difficult in keeping the men secret from each other. I just thought these girls are just conning men out of their money. I was only in holiday to have a break and was not interested in going out with bar girls. I was enjoying time with my travel companion, Sue, and yes, we had separate rooms. The holiday soon came to an end and I had another holiday with my travel companion in Egypt, which was okay, but we ended up falling out. She was a control freak once I got to know her, but I still keep in touch with Josh, who lives in the USA. After maybe six months later, I decided that I would have a good holiday in Asia, starting in Kuala Lumpur, then Patong in Phuket and Bangkok before heading home. I had been introduced by email to a lady called Dia, who lived in Kuala Lumpur, by my American friend Josh, who I met on the aircraft. 
Dia arranged to pick me up at 7 p.m. on the day I arrived to show me the sights. I was staying in the hotel over the road from the Times shopping mall. I arrived at the hotel at 4 p.m. The next thing I was asleep. The phone rang, it was Dia. I told her that I'd fallen asleep and I said I'll be, I'll be right down. Dia had her own 4x4 pickup truck, which was handy. We said our hellos and she did a full tour of KL at night. She then had a surprise for me. She took me to this nightclub where a lady was having a birthday party and it was in the VIP area. So here I was drinking and eating for free with total strangers. I got a lot of attention from the ladies and I arranged to go out for dinner the following night with a birthday girl. The following day I did the sights, went up the tall communications tower and after that I was back in town near to my hotel when the heavens opened up and it was like a monsoon. While sheltering from the rain, I got talking to a Malaysian lady who started to tell me that her daughter was going to the UK and that she had won a place at Lancaster University, but she was scared about going to the UK. This lady told me that her husband was a chef and would I like to go to their house the following day for a meal to meet her daughter and to explain what to expect in the UK and Lancaster. Well, I said yes, arranged to be picked up outside of the Time Shopping Centre at 2 p.m. the following afternoon. That evening, I was out with the birthday girl and I told her that I was going out for dinner with a family whose daughter was going to the UK. The birthday girl told me not to go and that it was all a scam and it's about gambling. The following afternoon, I was in the Time Shopping Mall and I spotted the lady and two guys getting out of an old Proton car. I thought this looks dodgy, so I decided to hide in the shopping mall until they left. I must have been in there for over an hour and noticed that the car had gone, so I made my way to the exit. I could not believe it. The lady was waiting for me and said, we've been looking for you, and she was not happy. Rather than say I wasn't going, I got into the back of this old Proton, was driven out of the city with this lady and two men. I asked if their daughter was in the house waiting. They told me that she had to go to the hospital and that she would be back later that day. But not to worry because her husband had cooked a nice meal for me. I explained that I had to be back to the hotel at 7pm because I was going out for a meal with my friends and that I didn't really want to eat too much. We arrived at the house and the husband was cooking chicken and rice. They offered me a drink but I said no due to what they might put in the drink. I asked what time their daughter would arrive but I did not get an answer. They told me that her uncle was upstairs and that he would like to have a chat with me so he came downstairs and started to ask about what I did and if I ever had gone to casinos. I told him that I never gambled and that I had never been to a casino. He then started to explain that he worked in a casino and with the help of me, we could win a lot of money together. I told him, no, I'm not interested. And I told the family that I don't believe that their daughter was coming and that I wanted to be driven back to the hotel. They were not happy, but they agreed. So back in the car and they called in, they pulled into a petrol station. They filled up the car and told me that I had to pay for the fuel since they were driving me back. I reluctantly agreed, I just wanted to get back to my hotel. I got back to the hotel, but I could not believe what had happened and how easy it was to get sucked into a risky situation. The lady knew I was from the UK, but she didn't know from where. For her to start talking about Lancaster University, which is close to where I live, was convincing, and I guess she got lucky with her choice of city. I did not let it ruin my night. I was out that night again with Dia and her friends, and the following day I was off to Phuket. It was a great experience and I did go back a few years later for the F1 race with a lady who would become my wife and it was nice to meet up with Dia again. I managed to book her into a nice hotel on the corner of Bangla Road and Beach Road in Phuket which was an ideal location. Now I am on my own and I can enjoy myself. I like my own company and I enjoy watching the world go by. It was just a matter of going out, enjoying good Thai food, drinking, chatting with people and enjoying the beach. One day, I decided to walk up a side soy where there was a few bars and a lady shouted, hello, welcome, come inside, please, take a seat. But I walked on. I don't know why, but the girl who had shouted welcome to me stuck in my mind. Later that night, I decided to visit her bar. She was now working behind the bar and it turned out that she was the cashier. The bar girls were hanging around me, but I wasn't interested in any of them and left. The following afternoon, I went back to the same bar. The cashier remembered me and we had a good chat. She was setting the bar up, arranging the bottles and the bar stools. After that, she started praying to the little Buddha shrine behind the bar, probably hoping that they would be busy that night. I had one drink and then I left. 
That evening, I was back at the bar and I got talking to an English guy whose wife used to work in the bar, but was now living in the UK. They asked me if I was interested in any of the bar girls. I said the only girl that I was interested in was a cashier. They said no chance. She is too shy and won't go out with customers. I thought never mind and carried on drinking. The following night I was back at the bar and the English guy said that him and his wife was going to the beach the following day with a cashier and would I like to come along. I said yes and I guess the rest is history. But I guess it is the start of the story because the cashier, who I will call Bun, I found out that she was cooking breakfast and other meals from 7am until 2pm, then she had to go and open the bar. The more I heard, the more I was shocked. She told me that sometimes she would close up and fall asleep behind the bar. Honestly, the person who was work she was working for treated her like a slave with only a few hours of sleep a night, and this was seven days a week. We didn't spend an awful lot of time with her, but I told her that she should consider moving on from that boss. The reason why she was there in the first place was to escape an ex-husband who was violent and she had to get out of her village. He gambled their money away, drank and went with other women. My holiday came to an end and within no time at all I found myself back in the UK and back at work. I would phone Boon every day and I arranged another holiday with her. She was still working at the same bar and at the restaurant during the day. Her boss was cunning. She owned a small guest house and would ask her customers to visit her bar. The bar girls would then hook up with the customers. She was on to a good thing. Not only was her boss making money from the guest house, but her guest was spending in her bar and of course she got a cut from all the ladies' drinks and kept the bar fines. However, on the plus side, the bar girls at this bar were making a very good monthly income. I arranged to meet Josh in Patong. He was in Asia for six months during the winter months. We were having a good time telling the girls their fortunes and I now had a drinking partner. I could see that Boon was very tired due to the amount of work she did. I asked her why didn't she go back home. She told me that she had bought a motorbike on a four year payment plan so she had to carry on working to pay off the loan. I asked her how much was outstanding on her motorbike. She told me about 25,000 baht or 600 pounds but she had 12,000 baht or 300 pounds in her bank account already. I offered to give her 300 pounds if she put her 300 pounds towards paying off her bike. Bun and I headed off to the motorcycle dealership and we paid the bike off. We didn't really spend much time together but due to her constant work I did give her a treat when I left. It wasn't much, I bought her a watch that she still has and I gave her about £100 and then it was time to head back home and back to work. We kept in touch and Boon told me that after she was paid she was going to escape her bus boss and go back home to her village. She arranged to send her motorbike back to her village and she was getting the bus back from home. Boon was planning to work in the family shop in her village plus her ex-husband now had a new living girlfriend so he wasn't much of a threat to her like before. I must say, in all this time, Bun never asked me for any money. It was me who offered to give her money to pay off the bike and to leave Phuket. After a few months, I was back in Thailand and we arranged to have a holiday in Bangkok. It was at the time that the airport was shut down due to the yellow shirts demonstrating everywhere in the city. I got an extra week for free. Bun was now working for her auntie in Bangkok, cooking for the family. Bun was a self-trained cook and was good. Her family had, a good, had good money and she had a decent salary uh, and the hours were less. During this holiday, Boon mentioned that her family were not happy because I never sent or gave her any money apart from when I was leaving at the airport. I would tell her, look, if we are getting on so well, maybe one day you won't need me to send you any money because you might be living in the UK and that has got to be much better than sending you money. The problem was that Boon was losing face to her family, as I appeared to be a boyfriend to Boon, but a boyfriend who did not take care of her financially. I tried to arrange a visa for Boon to visit me in the UK, but the application was turned down. Boon stopped working for her family and took a job in a food court in Pattaya, working 12-hour days. She lived in a room with three other girls and tried her best to be frugal and save money. Boon was a hard worker and she was also supporting a son who was going to school and she had a high hopes of him going to university. I tried again to get Boon a visa to visit me in the UK and this time the application was successful and Boon had a visa that allowed her to visit the UK for up to six months. Boon arrived in the UK in October. It was a totally different climate to what she was used to but she was seeing a brand new world. 
Everything we take for granted amazed her. She had never seen sheep in the fields or drinking water coming from the tap. My life turned upside down with Bun. She would put toothpaste on my brush. I had fresh clothes to wear laid out on the end of the bed. She cooked meals when I finished work along with a can of beer. I was waited on hand and foot. The morning came when Boon was returning to Thailand. I had just finished night shift and was tired. I had to set off to the airport at 10 a.m. to take Boon for her flight back home. I contacted Emirates and changed her flights to the last day of her six months holiday visa and I also booked myself on the same flight. We decided to have a two week holiday in Pattaya together. A few holidays later, I managed to get Boon another UK holiday visa and to cut a long story short, at the end of her holiday, I asked Boon to marry me while on holiday in Manchester and she said yes. So it was all planning, marriage visas to check and we arrived in Bangkok. I had to go to the British Embassy to get the marriage papers and then off down the road to get them translated and then off to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and more papers translated. The following day we were married. I sent all the paperwork in for the marriage visa and we went on a honeymoon to Koh Samui. Now it was just a waiting game for the marriage visa and I had to go back home. It was strange leaving my wife alone in Bangkok airport. Anyway, two days, two weeks later, Bun was granted a marriage visa and I was off to Thailand to bring her back home to the UK. Bun was happy to be called Mrs. Smith and she was also happy to be back in our house that she now calls home. During the last 10 years since getting married, Bun looked after my mother who passed away with cancer. She looked after me after a stroke. I'm okay now but retired at 53 and Bun now works in a supermarket and is the breadwinner in our household. I have to say that I am one of the lucky ones. I never used to send money to Thailand and the money that I did give Bun was a small amount but I always told her if we hit it off she would have a good life in the end. Bun never sends money to Thailand. Her family are doing okay with the family business. We are planning on Bun becoming a British citizen, which is good for her if anything ever happens to me. I hope my story isn't too long and I hope that you all, I hope you can all make sense of it. Yeah, we absolutely, I make sense of it. No, that, that's a great story. A lot of guys who watch this channel say, look, all your stories, Peter, they're all crash and burn. Uh, they're, they will always end in disaster. Haven't you got any nice stories? And the truth is, they're not my stories, are they? Guys send them in. I can only read out what I get. And it is very nice every now and again to get a successful story uh, like this one. If you if you guys are regulars and you know me, you know my wife's from South Korea. I, I was in a similar situation in the video last week. I'd mentioned that we came back in 2020. That was a mistake. I, we actually came back in the year 2000. And at that time, it wasn't so strict to get a, a future spouse into the country. It was quite easy, actually. And uh, I, I took a decision to get my wife a British passport um, in case anything happened to me. And it was a really good decision because in the last sort of 20, 21 years, things have, they've, they've really tightened the grip on everything and it's very, very difficult to bring people into the country these days, legally that is. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that one, guys. We'll go straight into our third story and uh, this is a, a very short story. Uh, so here we go. As described in my last story to you, the bars I am talking about are located in the south of Thailand, close to the Malaysian border and did not try to sell ladies drinks but rather flowers which were in fact a string of imitation flowers. Each flower cost 100 baht, so if you liked a girl or you wanted to have a chat or drink with her, you simply purchased one or more plastic flowers to give to the girl which she could exchange for cash later on. I was a regular, say two or three nights per week over a period of three years at these bars. In other words, many of the girls, bar owners and mamasans and bouncers knew me and in all instances, I think I was considered harmless and perhaps a little more generous than the average customer visiting the bars. There was this one particular girl, M, who I used to take out regularly for about one to two months and then I got bored and went on to other girls. The first couple of times she saw me with other girls, she would burst out crying like you have described many times in other stories. However, I never ignored her and always did buy her a few flowers every time I seen her and I became friends with her rather than a lover. A few months later I saw, her, I saw her outside the bar and I asked her if she would like to join me and my friend for a meal. I guess it was her day off. She said okay and after the meal she said she would take us to a bar where she did not work but a couple of her friends were there. We agreed and off we went. I was also a regular customer of this bar so all the girls were welcoming and the fun began. Once she saw a friend up on stage, she would ask me to buy them a flower, which I agreed to do. 
This went on throughout the night and after a while, my friend and I decided to go back to our hotel where we had already decided to meet some other girls earlier in the day. As we were leaving, we heard some commotion in the ladies' toilet that was just outside the bar's entrance, which we ignored and walked off. About an hour later, my friend started knocking on my hotel door, asking me to follow him out to look for M. I asked him why. He told me that he had bumped into one of M's friends and she was hysterical, saying that M had been beaten up by some girls at the bar we were in. I discovered later that the commotion we heard in the ladies' toilet as we left that bar was M taking a beating. We walked over to where M's friend stayed and discovered that she had been badly slashed with a razor blade and was in hospital. She was only discharged about a week later and used a lot of money for some plastic surgery in order for her to continue her bar girl career. The reason for this assault was that she only asked me to buy flowers for her friends and did not encourage me to buy any of the other girls flowers. I assume they were angry that they did not get to earn any flowers from me because of her influence and therefore decided to teach her a lesson. I guess the moral of the story is to ensure that no one loses face regardless of who they are, otherwise their wrath can take on a very violent turn. That's gruesome, that's a horrible story isn't it? Um, but where he's talking about, he's a Malaysian guy, he, he sent in a story a few weeks ago and he lives quite close to the Malaysian board, uh, the Thai border about an hour away uh, and because of business he had to drive into Thailand but it's right in the very very south and this is the area where they have quite a bit of problems, um, I won't get into that so much but most of the problems in Thailand come from that region down south and it isn't particularly uh, safe for Westing guys or women to to head down that way. Um, so that's it. That's the three stories this week, guys. Thanks for joining me. As always, I'll be back on Friday, 9 p.m. UK time. Another great stream last night. It'd be great if you guys could come along and join in the chat uh, for the stream next Friday. Uh, until then, thanks for putting up with me for another half hour, uh, and I'll see you all next week.